Welcome to the Sensible Socialist Podcast, a podcast for the rational left. We need to unite and work together if we're all going to get through this. Sounds like socialism to me. The amount of people I see talking about socialism positively is actually staggering. Do you think, we, I mean, do you really think that, we, that a, a proletarian revolution is just around the corner in America? Grab your pitchforks and stab your mayor. Little hero Obama. He's not my hero. I'm not a idiot. If Bernie Sanders were president, right, and he wanted to bring the same ideas as social, for socialism into this country, don't, do you think that we would benefit? I just told you Venezuela is eating rats. But I just want people to have health care. I don't want, like... <laughs> well, Same thing Hugo Chavez. Oh my god. Oh my god. You people have, like, worms in your brain, honestly. Welcome to this episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Gustafson. And in this episode, I wanted to uh, talk about some of the events that are going on in Latin America, specifically in Bolivia, but touching on Brazil and Venezuela and a number of other countries. And I thought that uh, the best way to kind of do that was to approach it from the perspective of the foreign policy of the United States towards Latin America. And to do that, we're going to talk about the Monroe Doctrine. The occasion has been judged proper for asserting, as a principle in which the rights and interests of the United States are involved, that the American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintain, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. We owe it, therefore, to candor and to the amicable relationships existing between the United States and those powers to declare that we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. With the existing colonies or dependencies of any European power, we have not interfered and shall not interfere. But with the governments who have declared their independence and maintained it, and whose independence we have on great consideration and on just principles acknowledged, we could not view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them or controlling in any other matter their destiny by any European power in any other light than as a manifestation of an unfriendly disposition towards the United States. James Monroe, 1823. By December of 1823, nearly all Latin American colonies of Spain and Portugal had achieved or were at the point of gaining independence from their Portuguese and Spanish empires. At that point, it behooved President Monroe and Secretary of State John Quincy Adams to announce at Monroe's 7th Annual State of the Union Address to Congress the U.S. position to European empires and their former or existing colonies. The doctrine spells out a foreign policy in the Western Hemisphere that would become the longest standing tenets of U.S. foreign policy, that further efforts by various European states to take control of any independent state in North or South America would be viewed as, quote, the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition towards the United States. But in a nutshell, the Monroe Doctrine says that Europe stays out of its hemisphere and the U.S. will stay out of theirs. There was good reason to be worried about colonial competition in the Americas. The U.S. government rightly feared victorious European powers that emerged from the Congress of Vienna would revive monarchical government. France had already agreed to restore the Spanish monarchy in exchange for Cuba, and as the Revolutionary Napoleonic Wars ended, Prussia, Austria, and Russia formed the Holy Alliance to defend monarchism. In particular, the Holy Alliance authorized military incursions to re-establish Bourbon rule over Spain and maintain or retake former colonies. The Monroe Doctrine, however, had another aspect. While at first glance the doctrine appears to be anti-imperial, it wasn't necessarily the case. Indeed, it, its stated objective was to free newly independent colonies of Latin America from European intervention and to avoid situations which could make the New World a battleground for the competition between old world powers. But why? So that the U.S. could exert its own influence over Latin American nations and do so undisturbed. 
The doctrine asserted that the new world and the old world were to remain two distinctly separate spheres of influence. So while old powers could battle it out for dominance on the old continent, the new world would be a place where the U.S. would reign supreme among the so-called independent states. The big test of the Monroe Doctrine would come during the Spanish-American War in 1898. Hostilities began in the aftermath of the dubious sinking of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor, leading to American intervention in the Cuban War of Independence. The sinking of the USS Maine occurred on February 15th and resulted in the death of 266 people. The U.S. blamed Spain, since the ship had been sent to Havana in order to protect a community of U.S. citizens there. And with political pressure from the Democratic Party, Republican President William McKinley entered war against Spain. Spain had promised time and again that it would reform, but it never delivered. And after the United States sent an ultimatum to Spain, asking it to surrender its control over Cuba, Madrid, then Washington, declared war. Although the main issue supposedly was Cuban independence, the 10-week war that was fought was fought both in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. U.S. naval power proved decisive, allowing expeditionary forces to embark in Cuba against the Spanish garrison already facing nationwide Cuban insurgent attacks and further wasted away by yellow fever. Numerically superior Cuban, Philippine, and U.S. forces obtained the surrender of Santiago de Cuba and Manila in the Philippines. With two obsolete Spanish squadrons sunk in Santiago de Cuba and Manila Bay and a third more modern fleet recalled home to protect Spanish coasts, Madrid sued for peace. The result was the 1898 Treaty of Paris, which negotiated terms favorable for the U.S. and allowed temporary U.S. control over Cuba, ceded ownership of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippine Islands. It was essentially an imperial transfer of the colonies of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, and Cuba from Spain to the United States. Still, by the end of the 19th century, Latin American lawyers and intellectuals routinely reinterpreted the Monroe Doctrine in terms of multilateralism and non-intervention. That, however, was going to change with the Roosevelt Corollary. President Roosevelt added the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine in 1904, asserting the right of the U.S. to intervene in Latin America in cases of, quote, flagrant and chronic wrongdoing by a Latin American nation. While the justification for this change was to preempt intervention by European creditors against Latin American nations, what happened was that the Monroe Doctrine went from an anti-imperialist doctrine to a straight-up imperialist one. Roosevelt's famous adage of speak low and carry a big stick is directly related to his position towards Latin American nations. The Roosevelt Corollary was invoked to intervene militarily in Latin America multiple times. It simply asserted U.S. domination in the hemisphere, making it effectively the hemispheric policeman. And the addition of it caused widespread outrage in Latin America. Just to give a flavor of the results of this, let's look at U.S. intervention during this period in which the Corollary was in place. In Mexico, the U.S. sent troops over the border in Mexico when it became clear in March of 1911 that the regime of Porfirio Diaz could not control revolutionary violence. Diaz resigned, opening the way for free elections that brought Francisco Madero to the presidency in November of 1911. The U.S. ambassador to Mexico, Henry Lane Wilson, conspired with the opposition forces to topple Madero's regime in February 1913 during what's known as the Ten Tragic Days. The U.S. intervened in Mexico twice under the presidency of Woodward Wilson, the first time when the United States' occupation of Veracruz by the Navy in 1914, and the second time when the U.S. mounted a punitive operation in northern Mexico in the Pancho Villa expedition aimed at capturing the northern revolutionary who had attacked Columbus, New Mexico. At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, the U.S. carried on several military interventions under the principles of the big stick policy, in what became known as banana wars. The term arose from the connections between the interventions and the preservation of U.S. commercial interests, namely the United Fruit Corporation, which had significant financial stakes in the production of bananas, tobacco, sugarcane, 
and various other agricultural products throughout the Caribbean, Central America, and the northern portions of South America. Indeed, if World War I had not lessened American enthusiasm for international activity, these interventions might have led to the formation of an expanded U.S. colonial empire, with the Central American states either annexed into statehood like Hawaii, or becoming American territories like the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. Countries involved in the Banana Wars include Cuba, Dominican Republic, Honduras, Haiti, Nicaragua, Colombia, and Panama. It would be the stated policy of the U.S. until the Clark Memorandum attempted to distance the Monroe Doctrine from the Roosevelt Colliery, but was ultimately not a rejection of the right of the U.S. to intervene in Latin America. Written on December 17, 1928 by Calvin Coolidge's Undersecretary of State, J. Reuben Clark, the Clark Memorandum stated that the Roosevelt Colliery was not based on the Monroe Doctrine, since the Monroe Doctrine gave the right to intervene in the case of European influence or intervention in Latin America. However, it was not a complete repudiation of the Roosevelt Colliery, but was rather a statement that any intervention by the U.S. was not sanctioned by the Monroe Doctrine, but was rather the right of America as a state. When the next Roosevelt was elected in 1932, a new policy was announced, though the Monroe Doctrine and the Colliery were never actually repudiated. In 1933, under President Franklin D. Roosevelt, the U.S. policy towards Latin America changed when the administration announced the Good Neighbor Policy. This policy would echo the Monroe Doctrine's expression of solidarity with then newly freed nations and aim to create a League of Nations for the Americas. The administration organized an Inter-American Conference in Buenos Aires. At the Inter-American Conference for the Maintenance of Peace, 21 nations pledged to remain neutral in the event of a conflict between any two of its members. The experience of World War II convinced hemispheric governments that unilateral action could not ensure the territorial integrity of the American nations in the event of external aggression. To meet the challenges of global conflict in the post-war world and to contain conflicts within the hemisphere, they adopted a system of collective security, the Inter-American Treaty for Reciprocal Assistance which was signed in 1947 in Rio de Janeiro. However, after the end of World War II and the brief Ecuadorian-Peruvian War in 1941, the era of the good neighbor policy ended as the Cold War began in 1945. Indeed, the United States moved from good neighbor back to hemispheric policemen, acting as a counterweight to Soviet influence around the continent in what would become the Truman Doctrine of Containment. It was in this new Red Scare and anti-communist milieu that the Ninth International Conference of the American States was held in Bogota, Colombia, between March and May of 1948. The meeting was led by the United States Secretary of State, George Marshall, and ended with a pledge by members to fight communism in the Western Hemisphere. This was the event that saw the birth of the OAS, the Organization of American States, as it stands today with the signature by 21 American countries of the Charter of the Organization of American States on the 30th of April, 1948. This meeting also adopted the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, which was, indeed, the world's first general human rights instrument. Countering Soviet influence, as shown by the pledge coming out of the Ninth Conference, became the obsession of U.S. foreign policy around the globe. The Soviet Union, being a European nation, made the Monroe Doctrine applicable again, and it became back in popularity with policy planners. For example, in 1954, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles invoked the Monroe Doctrine at the 10th Pan-American Conference in Caracas, Venezuela, denouncing the intervention of Soviet communism in Guatemala. Furthermore, President Kennedy said in August 29, 1962, that the Monroe Doctrine means what it has meant since President Monroe and John Quincy Adams enunciated it. And that is that we would oppose a foreign power extending its power into the Western Hemisphere. And that is why we oppose what is happening in Cuba today. That is why we have cut off our trade. That's why we worked in the OAS and other ways to isolate the communist menace in Cuba. That's why we will continue to give a good deal of our effort and attention to it. Indeed, it would be the OAS that would be the vehicle for the U.S. to express its neo-Monroe doctrine policy. 
So let's for a moment review the history of post-World War II interventions in Latin America, specifically the regime change actions. So buckle up. Costa Rica. Costa Rica experienced two interventions by the United States in the 20th century, but was the only Latin American country that never had a long-lasting authoritarian government in that century. Its only dictatorship occurred after the 1917 Costa Rican coup d'etat led by Minister of War Frederico Tinoco, after President Alfredo Gonzalez attempted to increase the tax on the wealthiest in Costa Rica. Despite the fact that the United Fruit Company was one of the affected companies by the Gonzalez tax, Democratic President Woodrow Wilson didn't recognize Tinoco's rule and helped the opposition that quickly overthrew Tinoco after just a few months of warfare. Years later, Christian socialist medic Rafael Angel Calderon of the National Republican Party would reach power through democratic means, promoting a general social reform and allied to the Costa Rican Communist Party. Tensions between government and the opposition, supported by the CIA, caused the short-lived Costa Rican Civil War of 1948 that ended Calderon's government and led to the short de facto rule of 18 months by José Figueres Ferrer. However, Figueres was also had some left-leaning ideas and continue, continued the social re- reformation. So in any case, after the war, democracy was quickly restored and a two-party system encompassed by the parties of Calderonistas and Figueristas developed the country for the next 60 years. In Colombia, workers and peasants, mostly of indigenous descent, revolted in the first half of the 20th century due to harsh conditions and abuse from landlords. But repression from government-supported American United Fruit Company in conjunction with governments brutally repressed these revolts. This revolutionary spirit would find its expression in the democratic election of Jacobo Arbenz in the early 1950s. Arbenz was overthrown during the U.S.-backed 1954 Guatemalan coup d'etat, leading to authoritarian governments endorsed by the United States and nearly 40 years of civil war in the Central American country. United States President Ronald Reagan, who sought to prevent the spread of communism in Central American countries near the United States, officially met with Guatemalan dictator Efron Rios Montt, who's now been convicted of war crimes and crimes against humanity, giving strong support to his regime. After the U.S.-backed coup d'etat against Social Democrat Jao Gorla in 1964, Brazil experienced several decades of authoritarian governments. The reason for the U.S.-sponsored coup, according to President John F. Kennedy, to, quote, prevent Brazil from becoming another Cuba. Cuba, of course, being the country in which had a revolution in 1959, which brought about socialism to the country, but who, of course, was then invaded by a U.S.-supported Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961. The United States engaged in a multi-decades terroristic war in Cuba, attempting to remove Castro and his communist government from power in Cuba, but were, of course, never successful. After the democratic election of President Salvador Allende in 1970 in Chile, an economic war ordered by President Richard Nixon, among other things, caused the 1973 Chilean coup d'etat with the involvement of the CIA, basically just due to Allende's democratic socialist leanings. What followed was decades-long U.S.-backed military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. In Argentina, military forces overthrew the democratically elected President Isabel Perón in the 1976 Argentine coup d'etat, starting a military dictatorship of Gen- General Jorge Rafael Videla, known as the National Reorganization Process, which resulted in around 30,000 forced disappearances. Both the coup and the following authoritarian regime were eagerly endorsed and supported by the United States government, especially with Secretary of State Henry Kissinger paying several official visits to Argentina during the dictatorship. A many of the human rights violations committed during the period were extrajudicial arrests, max executions, torture, rape, disappearances of political prisoners and dissenters, illegal relocations of children born from pregnant women, both before and after their imprisonment, or made pregnant by the continuous rape. According to Spanish judge Baltazar Garzón, Kissinger was a witness to these crimes. In El Salvador, after several peasant and workers' uprisings in the country against oligarchic and anti-democratic governments, 
often under the control of powerful American companies like the United Fruit Company, with the appearances of figures like Farbrubunto Marti, who led these social revolts and were violently crushed, efforts to take the power democratically were often thwarted by U.S. intervention. Civil war spread with U.S.-endorsed governments in El Salvador facing different guerrilla forces. In Nicaragua, after the Sandinista revolution that overthrew pro-American dictator Anastasio Somoza, Nicaragua faced the Contra guerrillas who were sponsored by the United States in a brutal terroristic campaign that ultimately led to a court case in which the United States lost in that found by the International Court of Justice that it was indeed supplying rebels and engaging in a covert war against Nicaragua that has basically still continued to this day. In Panama, Panamanian de facto ruler Omar Torrios, unexpected death in a plane crash has been attributed to the U.S. agents in collaboration with Manuel Noriega. According to John Perkins' book on Confessions of an Economic Hitman, the motive behind it was Torrios' negotiations with Japanese businessmen to expand the Panama Canal, which would exclude American firms. Torrijos was also a supporter of the anti-Samozan FSLN rebel group in Nicaragua, which sustained his relationship with Reagan. Torrijos was succeeded by a more pro-American dictator, Manuel Noriega, who sided with U.S. interests during Torrijos' government. However, increasing tensions between Noriega and the U.S. government also led the United States' invasion of Panama, which ended in Noriega's overthrowing. Even if the dictator that the United States supports isn't good enough, the United States can always have a coup d'etat against that dictator. In Paraguay, the conservative Colorado Party ruled the country for 65 consecutive years, including the American-supported brutal dictatorship of Alfredo Stronzer that lasted 35 years from 1954 to 1989. It wasn't until 2008 when there was finally a general election when all of the opposition would unite together they were finally able to break this U.S.-backed authoritarian regime. In Peru, another CIA-sponsored government was Alberto Fujimori and Vladimirio Montesinos, which were brutal dictatorships aimed at oppressing workers and peasant revolts. In Uruguay, after 150 years of traditional party governments in Uruguay, a civic military dictatorship backed by the United States started after the military led a 1973 coup d'etat it suppressed the Constitution and empowered President Juan Maria Bordaberry as dictator. Trade union leaders and political opponents were arrested, killed, or exiled, and human rights violations were abundant. Democratic traditions weren't even fully restored until 1984. What you can see here is a giant pattern of activity by the United States in which any time any kind of socialist-leaning or even left-leaning uh, government is elected by democratic forces in the United States, that the United States will have a coup d'etat and find a way to install a non-elected dictator in order to make sure that the United Fruit Company and other American interests are seen as prevailing. This all under the guise of the Monroe Doctrine and the containment policy of not wanting to spread socialism or communism, thereby seeing as Soviet influence or, U or European colonialism in the American colonies. What's this done is it's perverted the idea of an anti-imperialist Monroe Doctrine and meant for a specifically imperialist one. But now we have to talk about the Monroe Doctrine in the 21st century, after the end of the Cold War. And it's changed, because no longer do you have the Soviet influence that you need to counter. And so what we should see is the decrease of U.S. interventions in Latin America. But do you? No, you don't see that. What we see now is U.S. intervention in Venezuela, in Brazil, in Bolivia, in Honduras, in Haiti. The United States is still continuing its actions around Latin America for the same purpose it always has been. Whether or not it's given the guise of fighting communism or preventing against European influence in Latin America, the position of the U.S. has always been not anti-imperialist, but pro-imperialist. And the reasons for it have simply changed. But the policy, the overall policy that the United States can do whatever it wants in Latin America, still remains. Let's look at Venezuela. Venezuela. 
President Hugo Chavez was elected at the tail end of the 20th century in Venezuela. And in April 2002, he was briefly ousted from power in a 2002 Venezuelan coup d'etat. Members of the Bush administration held meetings with opposition leaders four months before the coup attempt, and Chavez accused the United States of being heavily involved. The OAS and all of Venezuela's neighbors denounced the coup attempt, but the United States acknowledged the new government. Chavez used the judiciary in order to detain or intimidate opposition politicians and NGOs, accused of receiving such civil society assistance that were purportedly used to overthrow the government. This is how the United States conducts its new imperialist foreign policy, with USAID and other NGO-supporting operations that are essentially violent opposition groups to social democratic governments in Latin America. Chavez died in 2013 after presiding over what he would call the Bolivarian Revolution, in which massive investments were made from the oil revenues into public investments and into housing, education, food, and other social necessities. This was, of course, done by nationalizing the Venezuelan oil and to the consternation of Texaco and other U.S. oil interests. The government was using oil interests to promote its Bolivarian missions. This caused the ire of the United States and it had an anti-Chavez policy throughout his time in office until he died in 2013, in which he was succeeded by Nicolas Maduro. Maduro's presidency coincided with the decline in Venezuelan socioeconomic status, with crime, inflation, poverty, and hunger increasing. And there's disagreement as to what has caused the Venezuela's decline. Some say it's the economic policies of Chavez and Maduro, while Maduro specifically has blamed speculation and economic warfare engaged by his political opponents, both inside and outside Venezuela, both of which, frankly, are true. In early 2015, the Maduro government accused the United States of attempting to overthrow him. The Venezuelan government performed elaborate actions to respond to these reported attempts and to convince the public that its claims were true. This included the arrest of Antonio Lazama, in February of 2015, forcing American tourists to go through travel requirements and holding military marches and public exercises in the first time in Venezuela's democratic history. After the United States ordered sanctions to be placed on seven Venezuelan officials for human rights violations, Maduro used anti-U.S. rhetoric to bump up his approval ratings, though how many parts of the Venezuelan people actually believe these, it's hard to know. But again, in 2016, Maduro claimed the United States was attempting to uh, provide a coup attempt. And in January of 2016, General Secretary of the Organization of American States, Luis Amalgro, threatened to invoke the Inter-American Democratic Charter, an instrument used to defend democracy in the Americas when threatened, when the opposition National Assembly members were barred from taking their seats by the Maduro Alliance Supreme Court. Now, this, of course, is because there were election irregularities with the National Assembly members, and the Supreme Court saw not to seat the members due to fraud in the election. This is, of course, contested by the opposition. Of course, Human Rights Watch and other human rights organizations like the Human Rights Foundation called for the OAS to do more and to invoke the Democratic Charter. And two days after, uh, on May 4th, 2016, the Maduro government called for a meeting and the next day with the foreign minister, Delque Rodriguez, stating the United States and the OAS were attempting to overthrow Maduro. In May, Maduro called the OAS Secretary General Luis Omalgro a traitor and stated that he worked for the CIA. This, though, is not as crazy as it may sound. The Organization for American States is essentially a U.S. mouthpiece that goes along with U.S. actions and policies almost every single time. When, in 2018, Maduro was re-elected in an election that was hotly contested, it was, of course, the OAS that led the charge, calling the election fraudulent. When Maduro was inaugurated for a new term, the result was widespread condemnation. In January of 2019, the president of the National Assembly, a basically unknown person named Juan Guaido, was declared the acting president by the National Assembly which was by this time packed with the opposition. 
Guaido was recognized as a legitimate president by several nations, including, of course, the United States, the Organization of America's States, as well as U.S.-backed and supported allies in the rest of Latin America. Maduro disputed Guaido's claim, broke off diplomatic ties, and engaged in a campaign against him. This is, again, an attempted coup d'etat, which there was on May 1st, 2019, in which Guaido sought to have a military uprising to oust Maduro from his position as president. The coup d'etat didn't work because it did not have the support of the majority of the Venezuelan people, and it was one of the first times that the U.S. was not able to have a coup in the country that it wanted to, but it would not be the only one. Indeed, before and after the attempts uh, in 2002 in Venezuela, but before the election of Maduro, in 2009 in Honduras, President Manuel Zelaya was overthrown in a U.S.-supported coup. This, of course, very much with the support and guidance of Hillary Rodham Clinton. In Brazil, the Workers' Party, which started in the 1980s, came rise to power in 2002 in the midst of a severe recession. Its party's leader, Luiz Anoco Lula da Silva, a former steelworker and trade union leader, promised to revive the economy and address Brazil's long-standing inequality problem and to rein in corruption. Initially, the PT was wildly successful and Brazilian GDP skyrocketed. Inequality, the biggest political issue in Brazil, fell dramatically, as did poverty. From 2001 to 2007, income inequality in Brazil started to decline at an unprecedented rate. And the Gini coefficient fell from above 0.60 to below 0.55, reaching its lowest level in more than 30 years. The incomes of the poorest tenth of Brazilians grew by 7% per year, nearly three times the national average of 2.5%. In less than a decade, Brazil had managed to cut the portion of its population living in extreme poverty in half. Indeed, the PT deserves a lot of credit, and Alula specifically, especially for its Bolsa Familia program which handed out direct cash to poor families if they adhered to certain conditions like sending their kids to school. And it played a significant role in the declines of both inequality and poverty. So when Lula da Silva's term was limited in 2010, the PT was still riding high, and his successor, Dilma Rousseff, was going to reap the benefits. She was a trained economist. She was tortured by the military regime in the 1980s due to her anti dictatorship militant activity, and she won the presidency by a 12-point margin, becoming the first ever woman to lead Brazil. She continued Lula's pro-poor redistributive policies, and that initially paid off with her personal, personal popularity peaking at 79%. However, in 2013, a crisis began. In mid-2013, Brazilian police detained a money launderer named Alberto Youssef, who'd been arrested nine times before on yet other money laundering charges. But by this time, Yusuf had something different to say. He began to describe what is now known as the Petrobras scandal, this biggest single problem for Rousseff's government. Between 2004 and 2014, the state-run energy firm Petrobras, which, in Brazil, which is Brazil's largest company and one of the largest corporations in the world, engaged in one of the most astonishing corruption schemes ever uncovered. It worked in four steps. Construction executives secretly created a cartel to coordinate bids on Petrobras contracts and systematically overcharged the company. A select group of Petrobras employees turned a blind eye, allowing the construction companies to charge Petrobras outrageous sums. The construction executives then pocketed the proceeds from these inflated contracts and rewarded their partners inside Petrobras with big bribes. And some of the proceeds also got sent to friendly politicians as either personal gifts or donations. Essentially, it's a giant $5.3 billion scheme to defraud Petrobras. Now, this leads all the way up to members high up in the PT, including Lula da Silva, who is then uh, jailed as part of your Brazilian prosecutors' uh, Operation Car Wash. And it leads all the way up to Dilma Rousseff, who of course, was never actually implicated in, in the scandal, but the PT was impl implemented uh, as former President Lula's energy minister uh, 
Rousseff personally chaired Petrobras's board. And until her presidential victory in 2010, from 2003, she was on the board. So this all occurred during her watch. So what happened? She was impeached and removed from office, in which time there was a, and Lula da Silva was put into jail. And so another election was called. And being in jail, Lula da Silva sued to be able to run uh, as the Workers' Party candidate. But he was disallowed from doing so. And so who is able to run uh, essentially unchallenged by strong members of the Workers' Party? Jair Bolsonaro, a former military regime-loving, homophobic, neo-fascist danger to the rest of the continent. This all with the thumbs up and a smile from the Trump regime. In Bolivia, in 2019, we have the latest instance of what the United States does to social democratic regimes in Latin America. On October 20th, 2019, the first round of voting for all government positions was held in Bolivia. And after the polls closed, the Supreme Electoral Tribunal began to release preliminary results of the presidential election. And by 7.40 p.m., when 83.8% of the votes had been counted, the preliminary count stopped. The tribunal's president, Maria Egina Choque, said the preliminary count had stopped because the official results had begun to be released. At that time, the preliminary count was stopped. Evo Morales, the indigenous and social democratic leader of Bolivia from 2006, led with 45.3% of the votes against his primary opponent, Carlos Mesa, who had had 382 Less than a 10-point lead would have resulted in another round of runoff voting. But at 9.25 p.m., President Morales declared himself the winner, stating that rural areas would almost guarantee his victory, being indigenous himself. Although uncounted votes in rural areas were expected to go his way, one body observing the election, the Organization of American States, stated that even if Morales did win outright, his lead beyond 10-point threshold would be so negligible as to warrant a runoff anyway. The OAS expressed concern about the day-long gap in results reporting. After 24 hours, the updates resumed, but with a large surge for Morales in the first update. An analysis by the Center for Economic and Policy Research disputed the OAS's findings and criticized the politicization of the electoral observation process. The co-director of the think tank, Mars Westbrook, stated the OAS showed, quote, no evidence, no statistics, numbers, or facts of any kind to support its claim for election manipulation. But on November 8th, the CEPR concluded that due to Morales' voter base being more in rural regions, the results from peripheral areas received towards the end of the vote count were more likely to be in his favor. The OAS would later push their findings in a more detailed audit two days later on November 10th. But essentially what the OAS is saying is that the election was fraudulent because of how many votes Morales had got. Immediately after the OAS's claim of election fraud, Protests suddenly erupted in, around Bolivia, claiming that the election had been a sham. These, of course, are the same groups that are promoted by the same organizations of aid and, and other NGO promotion that the United States engages in and the OAS also engages in. And throughout these protests, pressure was mounted on Evo Morales to resign. Eventually, the protests got so out of control that even the military was asking Morales to resign to quell the unrest, to which he did. And Morales left and is now in exile in in Mexico. The leader of Congress in in Bolivia, Janine Anez, was declared the president of Bolivia in the interim and immediately began to undo the social democratic policies of Evo Morales that had decreased inequality and increased the standard of living for the worst off. Indeed, even in a tweet, she called the indigenous people of Bolivia Satanists in a wildly racist tweet. This engagement in Bolivia is just the latest example of what the United States has always done in Latin America. If the government is able to bend to its knees, then they will succeed.
But if they don't, then they are going to be subject to a U.S. invasion or a U.S. coup d'etat. This has been the policy of the United States since 1823, that the United States sees the Western Hemisphere of the world as its sphere of influence, and it feels emboldened to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants. And this isn't a Democratic or Republican switch. This is something that both parties engage in with abandon. There is a united foreign policy in the United States of America when it comes to Latin America, and that is what we want, when we want, and we'll do whatever to get it. And let's be clear, this isn't to promote democracy or engage in anti-imperialism. This is an imperial campaign by which democracy doesn't matter and politics don't really matter. What makes the important decision is whether or not goods and services and human labor can flow from the areas in the periphery, that is in Latin America, to the center, the United States. It is the reason why we are given lesson after lesson in Latin America of how to stop and prevent against this kind of activity. If you see in Latin America the rise of social democratic leaders, they all come through in the ways that we would want them to, through elections, and they all become leaders that are responsible to their systems and they maintain opposition parties they don't nationalize all industry they do not engage in a revolutionary campaign to prevent the opposition from rising and ousting them eventually indeed the only example of a country that hasn't withstood the attempts of american imperialism has been cuba because the cuban government did do those things they did prevent an opposition from rising that would then be able to be the bastion of United States interests in the area. And they didn't collapse even after 70 years of a blockade and a 50-year-long terroristic war against them. Cuba is the example in Latin America about how to fight U.S. imperialism. And every attempt and every example of a left-wing government coming to power in, in Latin America that doesn't engage in the activities that the Cuban government engaged in is essentially doomed to failure. This is the difference between social democracy and socialism, that despite what disagreements I may have with the Cuban government system, they have shown the way to prevent against the U.S. invading or committing a coup d'etat against your government. And we see now Chavez, Maduro, Lula da Silva, Zelma, and Evo Morales are all now the victims of this same kind of activity by the United States. Yet Fidel and Raul Castro were able to see the end of their presidencies and to see their country remain independent of U.S. colonial influences and the dire impacts of the expression of the ill-fated an imperialistic policy of the Monroe Doctrine. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. This podcast is supported by listeners like you, and no advertisements or anything will ever be said. If you want to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash sensible socialist and give today. Also, please give us a review or a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast as it greatly helps. All right. See you next time.